greetings to everyone. We welcome you to our NRF Seon uh, Science Seminar, and we hope that you have an enriching experience. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you to our esteemed guest and international speaker, Prof. Sarah Berry. Prof. Berry is an assistant prof at MIT, Faculty of AI and Decision Making and CSEL. Prof. Berry was also a visiting prof at Google. A research focuses on building computer vision that enables global scale environmental bi and biodiversity monitoring across data modalities tackling real world challenges. So I now hand over Prof. Sarah Berry to present her talk. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm I'm really honored to um, come give a talk to this group. It's um, I've heard a lot about uh, about this uh, organization um, just through different work that I've done um, on the continent in Africa. And um, I thought that this would be a, a cool way to find if there are interesting connection points between my research and some of the different um, ongoing efforts that you guys have um, at Sion. Um, so I'm planning to just basically give um, my kind of bird's eye view of um, both what is already sort of very successful and exciting when we think about automating the process of monitoring biodiversity or monitoring the environment with AI, um, as well as um, what I think are some of the biggest open challenges where we kind of uh, need novel research um, to be able to make progress. Um, Let's see. So I think I'm preaching to the crowd here um, in this audience. I think you're all very aware of um, sort of the risks that current global biodiversity faces um, and the fact that not only are we seeing sort of populations of um, animals go down quite a bit. You know, I think that actually the most recent estimate is 69 percent average decline in species population size since 1970 from the WWF Living Planet Report. Um, but we're also seeing extinction rates um, grow exponentially across the taxonomic tree. So um, it's not really something that's just affecting kind of one taxa or another, but it's actually quite widespread. And, um, you know, this loss in biodiversity is, is intrinsically tied to a bunch of things that human society really values um, and are affecting human society. Um, things like climate change, public health, food security, and ecosystem services. Um, and I think one of the reasons that um, it's so difficult to even capture the information we might need to better understand, you know, where and in what way and sort of which species are at most risk and, and sort of how to allocate our, um, our resources and our efforts to try to maintain the sustainability of these ecosystems, to try to mitigate some of this biodiversity loss. Um, is that there is no direct sensor for biodiversity. So um, unlike something like trying to build a map of temperature where you can go out and place a temperature sensor that will give you a direct reading of temp temperature at that place, like maybe you know with some small error, um, in order to understand biodiversity in a place, um, we have to actually go out and place what maybe gets termed a proxy sensors. Um, things like cameras based on the visible, visible spectrum or hyperspectral cameras, um, sonar, bioacoustics, environmental DNA, all of these things are giving us possibly some view of some part of the taxonomic tree, but they're really not capturing everything. And because they're what we call proxy sensors, they, they actually, the data needs to be processed before we actually are able to extract the information that we really want from it. So we don't want, um, you know, RGB pixels of a scene. What we want is information about which species were there, how many, um, what times, what places, you know, their health, their behavior, and all of those things take additional processing. And, um, in order to kind of collect the information we need, we often need to collect data at very large volumes. And really what ends up being um, a, a big factor here is that we're collecting data at such large volumes that we really just um, 
can't or can no longer process data the way that ecologists or environmental scientists might have historically done it, which is going out capturing data for a specific question in a specific place on a specific taxa, processing that data ourselves um, by hand, and then um, and then doing the scientific analysis. Um, and the diversity of data that's captured, I think, is very broad. These are just the data types that I've personally worked with in my own research, um, but there are increasingly more and more um, different modalities of data available. Um, I've worked with, you know, aerial and, or mobile sensors like satellites, um, uh, low-flying aircraft and drones that are capturing maybe thermal, LIDAR, hyperspectral, on animal sensors, so movement ecology data. This is data coming from collars or RFID tags. Um, and then these networks of stationary sensors, um, things like networks of camera traps, which I've worked with um, quite a bit in Kenya, as well as um, bioacoustic sensors. Um, and then increasingly data coming from community scientists. I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of, for example, the iNaturalist platform or um, eBird, but some of these like larger scale repositories of data where um, passionate community members can actually go out and contribute um, with some sort of filtering through the community um, species occurrence records uh, directly from their cell phone. Um, and increasingly community science data is one of the largest sources of information we have about species occurrence globally. Um, I think they just now, they're almost at 200 million species observations um, from iNaturalist just in the last few years, which is pretty amazing and a, and a really, really massive uptick in information um, from what was possible to collect or maybe is possible to collect with, um, with non-human sensors. Um, but it turns out that, you know, in order to get this data processed, in order to sort of get um, data that actually has associated labels, um, basically has been processed by a human expert, annotated such that we might um, either be able to just directly use that annotation. This is the number, maybe a species occurrence annotation from, for example, camera trap images. Um, those are quite expensive and sparse. So looking at, um, uh, for example, Wildlife Insights, which is a sort of large scale platform that tries to help provide access to data management tools, but also machine learning species classification um, for camera trap data. There, you know, when I made this slide, there are about 40 million camera trap images in Wildlife Insights. I think it's now closer to 70 million, um, but about half of them have human labels. Um, there's a lot of data that is not yet human labeled. And most of the human labeled data is not necessarily expert verified. Um, so this data might be um, labeled by community members on something like Zooniverse, which is a community science driven labeling platform for scientific data, or they might be labeled by teams of undergrads or teams of non-experts, but not necessarily verified um, by people who truly have the expertise to be able to identify the species in the data. Um, and then when we think about, for example, these 40 million images, um, even for data sets that are labeled for something specific, like um, here it might, this image might be labeled with mountain lion um, coming from North America. Um, there's a ton of unextracted information, um, something we might call like data bycatch or environmental bycatch in data um, that we just can't train machine learning models to extract because we have no labels um, of that information, but it exists. So for example, the fact that we have, there's two mountain lions in this image that they are juvenile mountain lions, probably siblings, um, and looking at actually all of the different species of plants in the background of all of these camera trap images and understanding longitudinally how those plants are interacting with um, environmental covariates. There is a lot of information uh, that we can't currently capture and, and can't even dream to label because we can barely just label kind of the first order information in the data that we have. So um, this is all kind of really just to justify maybe my existence, but um, I believe we really need automation to help us scale in order to make use of the data we're already collecting to the best of our ability to make better use of the resources that we've put in to collect that data and to think more carefully about how we allocate resource to collect data in the future. Um, I think we need automated methods that are reliable and trustworthy that enable us to efficiently process this data um, with 
uh, the limited human expertise that we have. Um, and I think there's kind of been some really exciting successes of AI in ecology in recent years. Um, you know, cases where uh, it's not just that like a paper has been written where we sort of say, oh yeah, like uh, there's this proof of concept, like someone collected some small data set, they trained some benchmark and they said, oh, I'm getting like some number of accuracy on this task, like thus uh, this will be helpful for ecology, but actually truly AI successes where AI is a fundamental component of a system that is actively used and actively useful for many, many ecologists. Um, these are things like, um, for example, um, a model that I developed called the mega detector that just does really, really simple human animal vehicle filtering for camera trap imagery, but is used in 43 countries. We processed close to hundred million images last year. Um, and or things like uh, the computer vision suggestions in iNaturalist or the automated sound ID capability in the Merlin app. Um, these are things that have, you know, the Merlin app, for example, sound ID has close to 3 million users a month now. Um, and so these really are um, sort of examples of AI that is actually maybe changing the way we do ecology and is um, kind of made it into translation and into the hands of users and stakeholders. And there's, I think, some fundamental themes that are shared in a lot of these cases that I think are really interesting to think about um, for ecologists when they're sort of grappling with how and when they might want to engage with, um, with the machine learning community. Um, so for example, um, I think one very key component of most of these AI successes is the um, effort put in to curate diverse standardized data sets with clean labels in order to train the machine learning models. Um, and clean labels here is I think the key. Um, most of the ecological data sets that I um, get, you know, directly from ecologists, like I'm lucky if they're only 10% only in error, um, usually it's much higher. Uh, so ecologists often think maybe that their labeling process is, um, is infallible, but usually it's really not. Humans just make a lot of mistakes, um, and particularly humans that are very tired because they've looked at 10,000 images uh, that day. Um, and actually a lot of, uh, for example, with Merlin Bird ID, a huge amount of the um, improvements in the method really just came from cleaning up the training and evaluation data as opposed to uh, being something fundamental in the methodology. Um, I think another really key component is sort of starting from the best possible pre-trained models, um, you know, making use of modern uh, sort of state-of-the-art AI and, and sort of the very, very expensive pre-training that's happening from large companies um, who are using AI for very, very different tactics um, or different applications, but making use of those models and sort of not um, reinventing the wheel, but actually kind of having an understanding of what's out there and then making good use of it um, when it's available. Um, and then I think maybe one of the more important ones is um, these AI successes all are based on closed feedback loops and iteration. So the idea that, you know, you build one training data set, you train a model, and then you sort of never retrain it, or you don't get feedback from the users and sort of figure out where it's failing and, and continually work to improve it. Um, that feedback loop is, is pretty necessary, I think, to, to really build um, a, sort of an AI a system that includes AI that's actually um, kind of serving the needs of a user community, like you know, interdisciplinary science community in um, conservation technology. Um, and finally, and I think kind of interestingly, um, one of the things that basically all of these th these um, successes do is they ignore what we call the long tail. Um, so if you think about all of the species on Earth, you can imagine that there are a huge number of them. Uh, that are very rare, that we see very rarely. These are often the species that ecologists are most interested in um, because they're rare, because they're endangered, because they're novel. Um, it turns out that machine learning is fundamentally bad. And this is still just a huge open challenge in machine learning to be able to identify something um, from just a few examples. It's something that humans are actually able to do quite well, um, but ecologists really struggle with. Um, or no, sorry, machines, <laughs> ecologists are great at it. Machine learning models really struggle with this. Um, and so often actually what these successes do is they basically say, all right, 
we know that the model is not very good at the long tail. So they either aggregate up to sort of coarser levels of prediction, or they actually predict only at some level of confidence that often results in a coarser level of prediction, um, or they just consider a lot of the rare things to be some unknown class and they resurface that to the humans. This is kind of a mechanism called um, selective prediction, where basically the machine learning model predicts on the things it's confident on, and then um, it kind of surfaces to a human user um, the things it's not confident on. And um, most of these successful methods do some combination of these things. They do not expect the machine learning model to do well on that long tail where we have very few training examples. Um, and really, I think uh, that long tail is, is one of these examples of open challenges, something that is still very hard for machine learning. Um, and then this is actually exacerbated by this other factor um, called distribution shift. Um, so here, just when we're trying to illustrate that long tail that I was talking about, um, if you look at the distribution of observations in iNaturalist, and these were just the first 16 million observations in iNaturalist, but you know, now there's uh, an order of magnitude more. Um, you can see that if you if you assume you need around 100 examples um, for a machine learning model to be able to learn something um, very accurately, um, there were at that point maybe 10,000 species that were over that threshold. Um, so 10,000 species that the model could reasonably learn to identify. Then you can see there's this order of magnitude more species that are in this low shot regime that are in the sort of long tail. and you know, this order of magnitude of species, they're all kind of the things that machine learning models are still unable to identify. Um, and there's about a 10x gap between, you know, how many examples maybe a machine learning model needs and how many examples a human needs. A human can learn to identify a new species, usually with maybe three to seven examples. It's it's quite, we're quite efficient. We're very good at generalization. Um, and when we talk about this exacerbation with distribution shift, um, so, these machine learning models are, are just another form of statistics. And so they're learning likelihoods, right? Somehow um, often based, they're learning some sort of rough prior of likelihood over the category set based on the balance of data, based on sort of how many of a given species are, are being seen during training. And you can imagine that when we think about now, you know, going from some fixed data set to the globe where species distributions are different sort of everywhere on earth, um, and uh, and changing over time and increasingly changing with climate change, that um, essentially these models are learning priors that might actually be not only unuseful, but potentially actively harmful if we're now training a model with one distribution and moving to a different distribution um, at, test, at test time. And so this makes it very difficult to train models um, maybe in one place and expect them to work well in another place. And so there's this need to figure out how to adapt to these shifts in distribution. Um, and this is even just a rough example of, again, like how um, kind of complex this is uh, when we think about this species rarity and these sort of changes in distribution and like what we might be able to expect a machine learning model to learn versus um, what, what would still be difficult. If you look here um, on the top, this is an estimate of alpha diversity. It's just like a rough map of global biodiversity. Um, you can see that the most of the biodiversity on Earth is really here in the sub-equatorial tropics. Um, but now if you look at species occurrence data in GBIF, this is a heat map of where we actually have occurrence records. Um, you can see it's almost anti-correlated. Um, Though you'll note that there is this nice big hotspot in um, South Africa. And I think that uh, that the organization um, that you're all part of is, is a huge factor there, um, that you know this is an area where we do have um, quite a bit of biodiversity data. Um, and so then if you kind of add one more level of complexity to all of this, um, not only do we have things that are rarely seen and you know this dimension of distribution shift, we also have what we call um, fine-grained categories in the computer vision literature, um, but that basically just means stuff that looks the same. <laughs> um, so this is one example, American crows and common ravens look very, very similar. Um, and it can be really difficult um, for humans even uh, to be able to accurately identify these unless they're really, really experts. Um, but one interesting line of work that um, a colleague of mine, Grant Van Horn has been looking at is thinking about the value of different data modalities and how actually combining information across modalities of data 
might help us disambiguate some of these difficult uh, computer vision tasks. So here, you know, the American crow and the common raven might look very similar, but they sound very, very different. And so they're much easier to disambiguate in that audio space. But then there are other species where exactly the opposite is true. And so these combinations of modalities of data potentially give us um, much more diverse identifiability in, in species. Um, and kind of similarly, this is some recent work of mine where we're looking at trying to think about multimodal behavior identification, um, recognizing species and their behaviors um, across taxa. Um, and this is a very large scale benchmark data set we published this year um, that looks at these uh, sort of ecologically defined um, behaviors as opposed to sort of just action. So it's not just like walking, it's things like hunting or grooming. Um, these were defined by um, ecological collaborators at the Max Planck Institute. And then we collected a very large labeled data set of these different behaviors across different taxa um, of mammals. Um, and the hope here is that we would actually be able to build a generalizable kind of off the shelf usable tool that would be able to potentially recognize some of these behaviors um, even in species where they hadn't been seen before by sort of learning what these behaviors look like for different taxa. Um, and it's definitely still ongoing work, but it's kind of cool to start thinking about or start seeing how um, these different modalities of data and video and audio can all kind of come together and um, potentially lead to methods that, again, just make it more efficient to extract information from the data that you have that you might want to use to answer an ecological question. And so now going back to this sense of how ecological data is not IID, um, and really just emphasizing it's not IID almost in any dimension. It's IID here means independently and identically distributed. This is a fundamental assumption in a lot of machine learning models that your training data and your test data are going to be IID. And in ecology, we break this basically always. Like we almost never have IID data. Um, and so it's not IID spatially, right? If I go uh, from Kruger to Cape Town, the distribution of species is very, very different. Um, it's not IID temporally, um, and it's not even sort of seasonally IID because um, the migration of species is very much related to specific environmental covariates year to year. Um, and it's not IID taxonomically. We have huge biases in terms of what taxa we do or do not tend to collect data for and kind of how these different common modalities of data are able to actually capture um, different taxa. And it turns out that this type of distribution shift um, in the computer vision literature has been shown to be a pretty ubiquitous challenge. And that when we do think about building evaluation frameworks that test a computer vision model's ability to identify species, maybe in a set of cameras that are seen during training versus new cameras that are placed out, even in those same ecosystems, but just not the exact same locations that you can see sometimes uh, you know, up to 16% 16 drop in performance. Um, and this is a macro of one. So it's kind of a harmonic mean the scene, between the precision and the recall of these multi-species models. Um, and it turns out that type of performance degradation is also ubiquitous. It's, it's really something that we see across all real world applications of machine learning. This is really one of the most fundamental challenges, the ability to build models that are robust to distribution shift or able to adapt to distribution shift. Um, and we find from the camera trap space that um, this happens even for common species. So it's not just that actually the long tail is really hard and maybe you move to a different distribution and, and there's like some complexity in that long tail. We, you know, the errors are lower, but we do see this drop of performance going from in distribution to out of distribution locations, even for species that have, you know, 10 to the fourth uh, training examples. So it happens even for common species, this type of degradation. And again, distribution is possibly um, plays a role here. So uh, this is just looking at distribution over species for three different camera traps in the same national park. And you can see that, you know, the distribution, the subpopulation distribution of species at these different locations is, is very different. Um, they each basically are some microhabitat that captures something about local animal behavior. And so it's not even just distribution like region to region, it's even just within a region um, that these distributions can change. 
Um, okay, and then also I just wanted to point out, like, please feel free to speak up and ask a question at any point, um, or if someone wants to monitor the chat and help me keep track, um, it's kind of hard for me to talk and monitor, but I'm really happy to be interrupted and, and answer questions throughout if anyone has any. Um, all right, and then not only do you have the subpopulation change, you also have what we call like visual shift sometimes. So that could be things like temporal or seasonal changes in the background. You know, these are all the same camera trap with the bobcat. Um, sometimes those can be incredibly drastic. Um, for example, when you have natu natural disasters like wildfire. Um, and some of them are actually just sensor related. So maybe you actually have a sensing modality that uses white flash at night versus an infrared flash at night. And there's statistically very strong differences between those two things. Um, and another factor is that high visual similarity in the data from one static sensor renders it kind of inefficient. Um, the sample efficiency, the value of each of these samples is very low. So if you had both of these samples in your training data set, their, their sort of added value is not as high as it would be if you had something that was a, a very dis different sort of um, picture of that same species um, with a different background, a different pose. Um, and you can also see how you might kind of almost like memorize this, right? So if you were training on this data that testing on this one, you would get probably very high performance, but it might not mean that your model is actually sort of very accurate at identifying deer in general. It's just gotten very accurate at identifying deer in this particular constrained setting. Um, and actually this is really what we see if we subsample the amount of training data from static sensors, from camera traps, from 100 to 50%, to even 25%, our out of distribution test accuracy changes very, very little. So that really seems to suggest that um, a lot of the data is so highly repetitive that we're really not getting much value from it. And then that means that you're training on it, it's kind of inefficient. Um, so looking at, you know, spreading out and, and moving beyond camera traps, we really see that this, these two characterizations of kind of distribution shift, this subpopulation shift and this visual shift these are also very, very consistent across ecological applications. So this is looking at um, doing tree crown detection in the National Ecological Observatory Network in America. You can see that the distribution and the sort of what these trees look like are very different for different ecosystems. Um, if we're looking at detecting and counting salmon in static sonar, similarly, when we move to, from river to river, we see these pretty fundamental differences in maybe background, um, bathymetry of the river, the reflectance, maybe the size of the fish due to the sonar parameters. Um, and if we look at something like detecting and categorizing bird song and static bioacoustic sensors. So here, let's see if you can hear them. Oh. Um, so this is one sensor location. That was one species, here's another. Um, and then if you listen now, you can just hear how different the background like signal to noise ratio is at this new location. So you can imagine how um, a model would really potentially memorize um, some of that context from the background and start to learn some potentially behavior that we wouldn't want um, about kind of how the relationship of species to specific types of background noise that might even be mechanical and not related to the underlying distribution of the species. Um, and the, beyond that, um, sampling bias is really just not uniform across taxa um, for these different sensing platforms. And this is something that ecologists know well, right? There's this sense of, um, for camera traps, for example, uh, there's a set of species that are sort of camera trappable, like mid to large terrestrial mammals are sort of what this is maybe optimal for. Um, and if you're trying to use camera traps to monitor small mammals, uh, it gets a little trickier, right? And part of that is, um, or for example, reptiles, it gets trickier. And part of that is actually just on the sensors themselves. So um, if you're looking just at vertebrates, um, he, there's this sort of sets of things that are warm blooded or cold blooded. If your camera trap is using an infrared trigger that's looking at temperature differentials to determine when something has uh, gone across the camera and when data should be sampled, 
you're going to be systematically undersampling cold-blooded species because the temperature differential is not as high. Um, and so this kind of leads to this set of almost uh, heterogeneous sampling strategies. And in ecology, this has for a very long time been uh, treated as a very interesting like Bayesian statistics problem, right? Like how do you combine this distribution of data coming from a naturalist with maybe uh, you know some data sampled from remote sensing, where you know you're getting tons of spatial coverage, maybe even high high temporal frequency, but it's very low resolution to maybe like this very different distribution of um, you know ground level camera trap data. How do you combine this data with these different sampling biases, these different sampling strategies, um, to try to actually understand something like a uh, species distribution? Um, but I'm actually quite interested in um, kind of moving some of that a bit earlier. So instead of thinking of like, how do we actually combine information once it's been processed out of all of these proxy sensors, um, I'm interested in how do we combine information during processing to potentially improve identification of species and rare species by sharing information across these different modalities of data. Um, and so as sort of a starting point along those lines, um, one of the things I've been working on recently is um, identifying uh, individual trees and uh, to, this, to the genus level in cities. So looking at um, using a combination of aerial data, either high resolution EOS or lower resolution satellite data with ground level sensing coming from Google Street View. Uh, which is kind of a proxy potentially for a camera trap, right? It's this more valuable, potentially higher higher resolutions, like ground level views of um, species, in this case, trees. Um, how do we then share that information and do a better job for species that maybe we don't have that ground level data for? And how do we kind of understand the value of each of these types of data? So this is um, kind of a problem setting that I've been working on um, in partnership with Google because you know, they've been collecting Google Street View data. Um, and we're looking at this over about 23 cities across the United States, um, 344 different genera and over about 2.6 million trees. And we published a data set that actually has um, a million trees with associated imagery. So this is a latitude longitude genus label as well as aerial and ground level views. And again, you can see that even when you're thinking about urban forests, you really do still have this long tail distribution of species. So frequent species, common species, rare species is how we've broken this up. And when we actually look at our performance, if we look at the performance on rare species, it's basically zero. So this is still an open problem. Um, we do find, and this is interesting, that models trained on sort of the full data set will, will often outperform city or region specific models. So exploring whether we want to have one global model for everyone or whether it's actually better in some cases to have specific models for specific ecosystems or specific regions. And I think the interesting thing is that it doesn't always help. So for example, if you look at Los Angeles, um, the performance from the, the model just trained on LA data versus a model trained on the entire West Coast versus a model trained on all of North America, um, uh, in our data set at least, the performance is very, very similar but the cost of training this model for just LA versus, which is like about 400,000 images versus training on you know, the, the million images across North America is much, much higher. And so this cost value trade-off in terms of like, when do we share data? When do you actually want to use other people's data or data from other places to train your model is something that I'm very interested in exploring further and trying to build just good sort of good best practices in terms of like individual users and individual tasks and how to actually get the best possible performance for those in a, in a cost-effective way. And again, it seems like distribution shift plays a role here. So if we look at the generalizability going from one city to another, um, we really do see that similarity in per genus distribution tends to correlate to uh, sort of generalizable accuracy when training on one city and testing on another. And not all data is created equal. It turns out that um, you can double your performance um, just looking at a single ground level image versus a single aerial image of the same thing. So we know that the ground level data is much more expensive to collect in some ways, um, but it's also much more valuable, but we don't have it for every tree. So there's these trade-offs in terms of like, when we're thinking about that heterogeneous sampling, how we actually bring together these different types of data and how we think about allocating resources, um, I think is something that 
needs a lot more uh, exploration from like this machine learning perspective. Um, and then I also think it's important to really, you know, in ecology, kind of be keeping up as much as we can um, with kind of the modern advances in AI. And I think there's an increase in sort of interdisciplinary scientists like myself that are really kind of living between these two um, scientific disciplines and, um, you know, by proxy of that do stay up to date on um, modern AI techniques. And, and some really exciting ones, I think, that are quite relevant for this field are things like um, increasing uh, the ability to do class agnostic localization. So in this case, instance segmentation, uh, getting the pixels corresponding to instances of, for example, individual trees using this as the segment anything model. This is off the shelf. It works really well actually on animal data. Um, and the actually labeling semantic segmentation is a very expensive labeling task. It takes a lot of time. So if there's something where you would need semantic segmentation or instance segmentation, for example, re-identification of individual animals where you don't want to have confusion about features coming from multiple animals. Um, now there are methods that will get you very cheap, um, like expensive uh, segmentation annotation. Um, also, when we're thinking about these very endangered, very rare species, one of the only ways to do better on those is to get more data. And often we can't just go get more data. We can't go out and collect more images of that thing. That's the whole point. We're trying to get images of it and it's very difficult. Um, but generative AI could potentially uh, generate synthetic examples that could improve training performance. Um, but here I think it's important to be very careful because in our actual preliminary exploration of this, we find that um, it's often feasible to get kind of course level generated things. So, um, you know, you can reasonably generate, for example, a, a white wolf, but um, if you were asking it to then generate like a white, like an albino timber wolf versus like some Siberian wolf, like in this fine grained space, um, you're not likely to get uh, images that were, are actually going to be useful in fine grained disambiguation. So this is an open area of research of how do you actually make sure that the things that are generated are morphologically accurate. Um, and then finally, I think it's very exciting to see um, the growth of these vision and language models. And one of the things I think is very exciting and interesting is thinking about how we might be able to build queryable systems that make use of these large vision language models um, so that people can very efficiently ask new ecological questions from, for example, all of the data in iNaturalist or an entire camera trap grid. Um, you know, things like, okay, can you find me every image of a raptor on a telephone pole in iNaturalist and doing that efficiently and then letting the human interact with um, so that they can actually get kind of very, very quickly um, access to some, some sort of more nuanced information without needing to label a huge data set and train a custom classifier for every single task they're interested in. Um, it's also cool to see the um, that there is more and more um, kind of pre-trained or foundation models specifically for environmental tasks. So this is just one example. Um, this is a model that's called, they call Presto, but it's basically um, a really nice uh, multimodal pre-trained representation for geospatial data. Um, and there's been a lot of efforts on this recently. And, and in particular here, you can see that they we're very, very careful to try to get um, a somewhat uniform distribution of labeled or sort of training data across the globe so that these things, these representations would be truly global representations. They wouldn't be biased based on kind of where the data was sampled. Um, there's also, you know, as we look at these massive models that are being trained by big companies, um, there's often a need for uh, compression or specialization to a much more efficient model. Um, that doesn't require, you know, very expensive custom hardware, fancy GPUs to be able to actually use it. Um, so another, I think, interesting line of work, this is some recent work that I've been doing with some researchers at um, IST Austria, is looking at taking some very large generalist models, something that's trained to sort of like do everything on the internet, um, and then calibrate it, even without labels, very efficiently to build a very sparse specialist model. And we find that we can take these generalist models and compress them sometimes 80, 85% um, and still get the same performance on these specialized tasks um, through this kind of task-aware compression um, 
uh, system. So if you are sort of needing to have um, real-time information about uh, something, like for example, you're studying human wildlife conflict mitigation or trying to detect invasive species. And so now you might actually want to be processing on the edge. Um, it seems like potentially compressing and specializing a model versus training a very small model um, from scratch uh, might be a more reasonable approach. Um, we also can learn uh, with neural networks, spatial representations of species. And these aren't quite the same as a species range map or a species distribution model, but they're starting to perform um, or even outperform uh, on some sort of specific evaluation tasks, like looking at how well um, these spatial representations of species might um, match, for example, um, the range maps for birds and the eBird status and trends. Um, we do, we are seeing some pretty exciting performance. And the cool thing about this is that these are often now, they're spatial representations that are jointly learned over 10,000 species. So you're actually in a huge way benefiting from being able to share information across tons of different species using neural networks um, in a way that is really not computationally tractable in sort of classical statistical methods. But of course, it's a black box system. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of sort of challenge when you're actually now trying to think about doing inference with these models and understanding how the different biases in the model might impact that inference. So there's still a lot of research to do, but it is really exciting to see. Um, and then I think it's also important to note that like machine learning does not need to be perfect to be useful. Um, so this is a participatory system that I've built um, with a bunch of collaborators and it's been deployed with the Mara Elephant Project in Kenya for about three years now, where we're um, monitoring a population of individual elephants. And this is through a combination of um, inexpert coding of these elephants and computer vision-based re-identification. But the important point being that we were able to sort of start from scratch with no training data by kind of building a system that made it easy for humans to kind of collect and label the data needed in a way that already was letting them monitor the population in the way that they wanted to do. And then we were then able to build on top of that and we're increasingly making the, those humans more and more efficient, requiring less and less human input for the different um, elephant identification tasks as needed based on model uncertainty. So again, kind of in this selective prediction space where we actually have kind of human verification in the loop, but it's enabled us to monitor a population of um, close to 2000 elephants um, with just a small team that do not need to actually be experts who can you know, remember and identify every single one of those elephants. Um, and you know, some tasks are easier for non-experts than others. Um, this is kind of an effort uh, with um, a student who's working at Zooniverse where we've actually been building out um, a system to enable uh, the crowd, sort of community members in the cloud to start capturing some of the information that's needed for elephant re-identification. Um, and it turns out things like, you know, who is this animal? That's definitely an expert task, but are these two animals the same is less of an expert task and doing things like, you know, drawing the contour of an elephant ear, that's not actually something that requires expertise. It just requires time. And so you can think about kind of how to make use of experts efficiently and scale also with human capability. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, this is that mega detector model I mentioned earlier. But um, again, when you say imperfect models can still be useful, it turns out that getting a model that will accurately identify the species of, you know, every species that might be seen in a camera trap anywhere on earth is a pretty difficult task. Um, but we actually can build very robust models to identify animals, even in ecosystems and for species that have never been seen by the model, because you're asking the model to learn these coarser categories, which means that actually even rare things kind of fall into that representation space more easily. Um, so I think that there's a lot, um, a lot more that we can do in terms of thinking about what granularity of task we should give a computer vision model such that it's reliable and um, really thinking about what we maybe want a human expert and ecologist to still do in terms of processing the data and moving away from the idea that you want the computer vision model to kind of fully label in a completely automated way all of the data you have, um, making the best of kind of human intelligence um, when we have it accessible. Uh, and this is like one of my, my favorite examples here, but um, it turns out like we didn't need to identify this species of bird 
to be able to save Sarah Bessing a huge amount of time in terms of processing her data. So again, just thinking about um, what we need models to do and you know how they might save time or be useful or be impactful, even if they're not necessarily solving the problem we want them to solve end to end yet. Um, and in terms of what's next, I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done in uh, understanding anomalies and change, uh, detecting when these models are not working well, um, uh, again, extracting more bycatch from the data we've already collected. There's so much more information in there that we do not currently have access to just because we don't have good systems to process it. Um, more interactive specialization and increased efficiency, both in training and evaluation of the models, determining whether a model is sort of good enough for your use case and how to use it. Um, and I did want to call out that there is a pretty a uh, wonderful, well-engaged Slack community in these areas called AI for Conservation. Um, and if you're not already on there and you're interested in using computer vision or AI to process some of your ecological data, I would, I would very much recommend. It's a great place to find out about opportunities and resources and jobs, but also um, just ask questions and share best practices. Uh, cool, all right, so I'm happy to take any questions and thanks for listening and yeah. Thank you, Prof. Berry, for an incredibly insightful talk on computer vision and its role in enabling biodiversity monitoring. So we now open the floor for questions. We have a question in the chat from Craig. He wants to know if you can comment on OOD that results from fine-tuning satellite images on pre-trained image net from some like RSNet. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so actually, I think some of the most interesting. Um, so, if you're trying to use computer vision to uh, identify something from satellite imagery, I think one really important thing to think about is like what dimensions of invariance do you want your model to have or not, and think about um, if and how and when a model trained on ImageNet might have invariances you don't want or not have invariances you do want. Um, and one, there's actually a really nice paper by, um, I'll put it in the chat, Elijah Cole, um, where I think it's called like, when does contrastive representation learning work or something? Um, but he actually really does systematically explore for different applications, including satellite imagery, kind of for different downstream tasks, things like land cover classification or something like species distribution modeling. Um, how do different types of pre-training objectives, like training on ImageNet with supervision, training on iNaturalist, specifically training on satellite tasks, um, how do those actually affect downstream performance for different tasks you might want to identify from satellite imagery? And I think it's actually the interesting thing is it depends on the task. For some tasks, ImageNet pre-training is probably just about the same as satellite pre-training. And for other tasks, that sort of more specific, like in distribution um, pre-training tends to be much more important. Um, and I think also they do do some nice comparisons in that Presto paper that I mentioned um, with like Hannah Kerner and David Rolnick um, are the, some of the authors. Um, Rolnick. And there they also explore kind of the effect of their kind of presto pre-training versus like other types of pre-training for different downstream satellite tasks. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it just depends on the task. Um, and I don't know that there is sort of a one representation that's best for all possible tasks you might ask in satellite imagery. Michael, do you wanna ask your question? Michael? I saw you raised your hand, but. Hi, Michael, you're on mute. Or maybe Mary, I guess maybe, maybe Mary Jane, do you have a question? Yes, thank you so much for that really interesting presentation. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I thought maybe you can speak a little bit to the computational expense. You sort of touched on it when you talked about 
the volume of data if you train a model with regional data versus if you wanted to use a full set of data. So, mm -hmm. so I think there perhaps you can talk about even imagine GPUs that you require CPUs or GPUs, which one works best? I think it's a conversation we are having in the meteorology community whether GPUs can be useful, but it sounds like for your area, GPUs work better. Then, then the other question is around the software that you are using. Is it generally open software that you use to develop your models? Um, and then the last question is just on, I mean, you've mentioned working in different countries that, that you know, models have been run in different countries. So if you can just talk to how, like how your collaboration mechanisms around that, um, how you've worked with different countries. Yeah, these are fantastic questions. Um, okay, so on the first one, um, basically talking about uh, computational needs. Um, I bring this up in these talks because I've really realized that working with ecologists um, and even I run um, something called uh, the this computer vision um, summer workshop for like methods in ecology um, where there it's basically a, a three week intensive training program for graduate level postdoc level even sometimes faculty level ecologists to come and learn very hands on applied computer vision skills so they can then use that on um, their own research questions. Um, and one of the biggest things is, you know, we provide GPU support during the summer program, but a lot of them then are like, well, I'm going back to my home institution. I don't have a GPU and, and trying to figure out what are the best mechanisms for providing access to the compute needed to be able to do this type of thing um, is, is, I think, a big challenge. Um, and GPUs can be very expensive. Now, the nice thing is, again, it just thinking about scale of data, basically you can buy um, a refurbished like V100 or P100 GPU these days for like a, a grand or two. I mean, it's not, it's still expensive, but it's not like a hundred thousand dollars. But then if you're training that on, you know, 10 million images, that's going to take a month. If you're training it on a thousand images, it'll probably be done in a couple of days. Um, so the kind of expense is also time, given like the computational restrictions that you have. And if the performance of the model is going to be the same, training on a thousand images that are selected versus training on you know 10 million, um, because the data is very repetitive, because we have these spatial temporal correlations in ecological data, um, then in those cases, like we should know, right? You should, you don't want to sort of waste your resources and and even if you do have that GPU in hand, like you're not paying for it on the cloud, because if you're paying for it on the cloud, you're paying for it over time, which means that 10 million image model will just cost you a lot more money and not provide any additional value. Um, but even if you own your GPUs, you're paying for power and that's resources. We all care about climate and the environment and this like sort of in like unnecessary use of resources um, is something that I think we want to avoid. Um, so, Yes, you are going to be able to iterate much faster if you have GPUs. Training on a CPU, often um, the way that the models are structured, they're really designed um, for the like many, many parallel multiplications that can happen um, on a GPU. Um, and so when you then try to move to training on CPU, either your batch sizes have to be very, very small or the models you can actually train on are very, very small and then they're very, very slow. Um, so I think a GPU is probably somewhat required, but it, depending on your use case, it might not need to be, you know, a node with eight A100s that costs, or an eight H100s that costs $250,000. It might need to be like, you know, a set of V100s. So it makes sense to look at your actual needs and try to do some estimates of like, what would the training times be? How much data do we really need to train on? Um, and then, Myself and others will keep working on the research question of how do you decide what data to train on um, and how do we make this as efficient as possible? Um, okay, and then the next question was about, um, okay, I remember the first one and the last one. What was the middle question? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it, it was on whether software you used to train. If it's oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So mm -hmm. I, um, I started out, uh, building machine learning models in TensorFlow. Um, since myself and many others in the community have switched over to PyTorch, both of these are open languages. Um, and then the computer science community and um, sort of the computer vision for ecology community really makes use of GitHub as a platform for sharing code and models and model weights. So 
I, I don't like to work on anything proprietary because I just think that um, we're all in it together and I don't want anyone to be selling stuff that I build. Um, I want it to be accessible. Um, so we do tend, for example, the mega detector. If you have a camera trap, uh, if, you're, if anyone at Scion is doing camera trap data processing and labeling stuff by hand, I am very confident that that model will save you a ton of time. It's completely open source. There's a ton of tutorials. There's a bunch of different people in the open source community that have built up uh, different resources and infrastructure to let it, to make it easier for people to work with that um, model. So, um, but yes, I, I do open source. I try to open source everything that I do. Um, and then uh, the last question was about collaboration mechanisms. Um, so when I, I mean, there are, I think a lot of people who are potentially interested to work in this space. Um, one of the thing, one of the bigger challenges is the communication, that interdisciplinary communication and like figuring out like how to understand kind of like the value for of different things for different people. Um, these days for myself, I have kind of a list of almost like re requirements just because a lot, a lot of what I'm doing is research as opposed to like direct application and deployment. So when I'm bringing on new collaborators in ecology, I look for people who are good Python programmers because I want to be able to give them code that then they can run and test and we can iterate quickly. And as soon as I have to build some sort of graphical user interface, then that needs to be supported. There's all this feature creep. It ends up really slowing down the research process on the vision side. So for example, I have a longstanding collaboration with the Mara Elephant Project. And a huge part of that is that their, their director of conservation technology, Jake Wall, is an amazing Python programmer. And I, we can actually just directly give him code that he can run. And I would really, these days, I would really encourage more ecologists to kind of, I know that everyone learns R, but learning, if you want to use computer vision, learning Python is, is a really, really valuable tool here. Um, and then uh, on top of that, like similarly, one of the reasons I built this educational program, this training program is because I actually think the right collaboration point is no longer like, hey, I have a lot of data. Do you want to just take it and see what you can do with it. I think the right collaboration point now is more, not every ecologist, but some ecologists learning to be good machine learning practitioners. And so providing access to those skills so that the ecology community, similar to how 50 years ago, if you wanted to build a statistical model for species occupancy, you'd like go to the stats department and say like, hey, like, can you work with me to build this model? And now like there are quantitative ecologists who, who are completely statisticians in their own right, who build their own statistical models. And I think we're hitting the point now where some ecologists need to be that, but with machine learning, you need to kind of bring that power back. Don't like let the computer science departments like own it, like bring it into ecology and like gain those skills and that knowledge and honestly that power. Um, and so that training program is really designed so that ecologists can take a new problem do the data science and data processing to think about how to split the data, how to formulate this ecological task as a computer vision challenge, how to train preliminary baseline models, just applied models. Like we're not talking about like changing the methods in computer vision. We're just what does sort of what's currently available off the shelf open source do on my problem. Think about how to evaluate it from the context of what's actually important for you. So if you're detecting invasive species, it's very important that you have incredibly high recall. You can't miss stuff. If you're doing species distribution modeling, actually like that it's not so important to have super high recall because there's in those statistical models, there's this sense of um, like probability of misdetection. So you can actually kind of absorb misdetections into the model, but false positives end up having a really strong effect. So you want to think about the evaluation of the machine learning model in the context of how you're going to use it. And that's something that ecologists are best posed to do. And then now you build your model, you train it, you evaluate it for whatever it's already good at. You can just use it. Now you, now you own the entire pipeline, but then you can come to me and computer vision researchers in this kind of interdisciplinary community and say like, here's what it's not good at. And then that's a computer vision research problem. And so it's kind of like, finding the right intersection point in interdisciplinary research so that you're not like asking computer vision, like researchers and scientists to be like sort of software engineers for you. Um, I think that's tricky. And I know that it's not easy to necessarily gain a lot of technical skills, but I don't think every ecologist needs this, but I do think an organization like the Scion has maybe the capacity to build 
the capacity to build capacity in machine learning. <laughs> um, it looks like uh, there was another question, Luther, you asked about, is it possible to pause the training of models for two to four hours? Um, yeah, so one of the things that you can do when you're training a model is you can, um, as you're training the model, you're sort of showing it all these different examples. Um, and you can basically save up what we call like intermediate checkpoints, which is basically you save the value of all the weights in the model at a given point in time. And then you can just load that model and immediately start training again from that. So you can, as long as you're saving off checkpoints periodically, you can, even if something crashes, you can like restart training, you don't lose any progress. Um, so you can kind of pause things as long as you've sort of saved off uh, the right starting point to then load back in to, to start restart training. Um, and then uh, Gitan, uh, based on your experience with mega detector, what would be considered to be useful takeaways for getting such an AI for ecology application to the broader ecology community? Challenges with maintenance after a PhD or master of science is done and funding and a whole lot more. Yes, I have been trying to figure out how to build sustainability into these types of projects for as long as you can remember. It is a really difficult challenge. And I think there's a lot of effort um, with myself and others to think about um, trying to push funding mechanisms. For example, I'm, I'm going to the NSF next week. And one of the things I'm gonna be talking about is in increasing capacity in ecology for AI. And the other thing I'm gonna be talking about is the need for um, funding for maintenance of tools that get really broadly used. But I think what I've found, um, particularly with the mega detector, is if you build something that is very useful and it needs to be very useful, like it can't just be like a little more useful than something else, then enough people will want to use it that the community will actually help to support and maintain it. And I think that is the dream of like open source science, right? Or this open source software maintenance community. I mean, PyTorch is not like this, but Python is actually kind of an open source thing, right? Um, Jupyter was originally open source and different people collaborate and contribute to things like SciPy and NumPy. Um, those are not kind of centrally, um, completely centrally hosted and maintained. Like some of them are really just on a volunteer community basis. And yeah, I think that maybe that's one path because one thing I kind of at first I thought like, oh, well, all of these big companies have all this capacity, all these resources, like they'll kind of perpetually host it. But I, I think I've kind of realized that even with the best intentions, like economies change, things change, like probably our best sustainability effort is just making things, making sure that our code is easy to use, open source and adaptable by any downstream user. Um, and then that does at least provide this like baseline layer of like, it can't just completely go away. Now, maybe they update PyTorch and now you need to like retrain your model and like, who's gonna pay to retrain the model and like who hosts all the data and like, do you still have access to all the data after you graduated? And like, there's a ton of issues and open questions. Um, and I agree that this is complicated, but I think open sourcing is a good first step. Um, and then thinking about how to actually support the maintenance of the tools um, and kind of like, you know, who the users are and like how those things can be supported is like a nice next step. Um, I think, for example, a nice, a nice one thing you can look at is iNaturalist. You know, iNaturalist is a huge process. It's actually supported from a, by, from a very, very small software engineering team. Um, and they were originally within the California Academy of Sciences and that kind of institutional capacity provided the support, the ability to like hire the software engineers and sort of keep them. They had funding through that and, and broader funding. Um, but just in the last uh, few months, they actually announced that they are going kind of, they're sort of now a fully independent um, organization. And they're going to be then sort of needing to fund the organization by themselves, but they, they did just get sort of a pretty large grant to do that. But I think even organizations like iNaturalist, you think of iNaturalist being like this incredibly stable, sort of very large, Thing. I mean, they have millions and millions of users a month, but it's really being supported by a very small team. Um, they're able to be very nimble and lightweight and they're sort of grappling with how to actually fund this type of thing as well. So I think it's a bigger, bigger challenge. <laughs> Sarah, there's a question in the chat a little bit more up from Michael Rampedi. Yeah, okay. 
I'm curious to find out how feasible it is for reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement learning with ecological data. Um, okay, so there's maybe two questions. Um, so deep reinforcement learning with ecological data, um, I think that there's potentially like very specific use cases where it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think one of the big challenges with reinforcement learning is um, if, so basically reinforcement learning tends to work well if we can build a synthesizer that lets us try a bunch of different policies over time. Um, so these classic examples are like playing video games where we can just run a bunch of video games very inexpensively. Um, I think the danger when you think about what that means in ecology is like, okay, so then what are what are your test set? Can you, can you build a synthesizer that we really trust captures all of the complexity of ecosystems? And if we can't, then like, how are you doing your trials, right? Like you, you build a reinforcement learning model it proposes some policy or some priority or some whatever, then you use it and see what happens. Like the risks are very high. Um, so I think that uh, that's possibly one of the complexities there. Um, I do think that there's been some interest, for example, Carl Bodiger at Berkeley wrote a paper about um, reinforcement learning for conservation decision support. But even if you talk to Carl, he's kind of like, oh, I, I wanted to write that as like a like a thought piece, like a flag in the sand thing. I'm like, I don't know if that came across, but like, I think that there's a lot of things we should think about very carefully in terms of risk um, with reinforcement learning in ecology. But there have been people using reinforcement learning or kind of these like multi-agent systems approaches to think about for anti-poaching, like how to design like ranger path planning and, and some of these types of things. And there, I think there's, like there's specific settings where it might make more sense as an approach. Um, yeah. Uh, and then when you you also asked with what I presented, how does the model handle artifacts given the spatial and temporal heterogeneity of ecological systems? Does it need a human expert to validate the designation of artifacts? Um, so I guess when you're saying artifacts here, you mean like maybe mispredictions or like sort of like strange biases that the model might learn. And yeah, I don't think, I think all machine learning models need quality control when we're going to use them in the real world. I'm very interested in these like human AI systems and kind of like, how do we, how do we use experts or use non-experts like effectively to do the verification that we need to kind of determine that the model is trustworthy and that model performance isn't sort of degrading or shifting or changing over time. Um, and yeah, I, I really do think that that a human expert is necessary. I don't see AI as like an automation tool. I see AI as an efficiency tool. Um, and I think most of the successes in AI, even now, and like, think about um, if any of you have played with like some of the generative AI models, like GPT, right? You don't use GPT and just trust it. <laughs> you ask GPT maybe to provide some preliminary thing. And then you as a human, correct it, filter it, adjust it, like make it good. And it maybe does make you more efficient. I mean, I know I often struggle to like get the writing down on the page, like at a starting point, right? And it's awesome if like GPT-4 can like, I'll be like, write me like a draft of a thing. And then I edit it and I ended up changing it a ton, but there's like a psychological thing where you can maybe like trick your brain into like that being more efficient or just getting started. So I think there's ways that these tools can be used and across the breadth of AI tools, but very, very rarely are they truly fully automated. Um, and I don't think in ecology, I don't think they should be, particularly because we have such challenging settings, right? We know the distributions are changing. Um, we know that historical data is not necessarily predictive of future data in many of these cases because of climate change. We know that the things we care about are rare. We know that things look very similar. Um, so we know our settings are hard. Um, and I think that the harder the setting gets, the more um, kind of human input is needed. But it makes things that would be intractable, tractable, right? I have a network of camera traps in Kenya. We collected 10 million images last year and like myself and a couple undergrads with the help of our AI models were able to process that data very, very quickly. Um, that would not be possible um, without AI, so. Okay, on behalf of Sion, we would like to thank you once again, Prof. Uh, Berry, for your for sharing complex machine learning concepts concisely. 
and also sharing with us what the future world of ecologists would look like. <laughs> we would also like to thank Dr. Mary Jane Bopape for introducing us uh, to you, Prof. Sari Perry. Okay, to all our guests, thank you for attending and we would like to invite you for our next seminar, which is on the 7th of September. And that will be from, by Wayna Kalitz from Arid Lands. The topic is using phenology for long-term ecological observations, a case study from the Kiru. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Please reach out if uh, at any time or definitely through the AI for Conservation Slack. I think that's a really great um, way to kind of get more involved. Awesome. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.